Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable! Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone! Chargers. It's a touchdown! An exclusive NFL game. That's fantastic! Live in primetime. Wow! Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Saturday, 7.30 Eastern. Exclusively on Peacock. This episode is brought to you by Google Pixel, the official fan phone of the NBA and WNBA. The new Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro are built different. How? Take the audio magic eraser tool that helps block out distracting crowd noise so your play-by-play commentary sounds crystal clear. The only phone engineered by Google brings out the audio you care about so your videos sound as crisp as they look. Learn more at googlestore.com forward slash Pixel NBA. Audio magic eraser requires Google Photos app. May not work on all audio elements. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. The holidays are a time to feel and create joy. And what could be more joyous than the look on her face as she unwraps a stunning new jewelry piece from Blue Nile? How about getting 50% off your purchase? Blue Nile offers premium quality, priced below traditional retail. Their online experts are available 24-7 to answer any questions and make sure you've picked the perfect gift. For a limited time, you can get 50% off at BlueNile.com. That's 50% off at BlueNile.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Blue Turf. This is Abel from the Kansas City Soccer Journal. With me, as usual, I have Eric Bergrud, uh, announcer, hype man, all around man around all around town. How else should I describe you this year? I, I don't know. <laughs> Other duties as assigned. That how's that? All right. Uh, we are, as Eric would say, at the world famous Kansas City Soccer Dome, watching practice or trying to observe anything so far, Eric. There's a lot of players out there on the field is what I've observed that. There is. There's still some roster moves happening too, I believe. But we'll, we'll dig into that in a minute. Um, first things first, I know been, this is a fourth week of training camp, a week before a game. Comets have done some scrimmages, but they had a, a semi-closed door scrimmage last week against Dallas. That was entertaining. Uh, Kansas City pretty much dominated that game. I know you arrived right towards the end of it. Yeah, so all I know is what I heard after the fact, and uh, you and I talked. I had a chat with uh, Sidekicks coach Eddie Piscara. She used to be the color commentator there, and uh, I know he had a bunch of young guys that he's trying to assimilate in. My sense, and you can maybe confirm this, is there was a little bit of experimentation by the Comets, some young guys getting a chance to play. A, uh, an amazing goal that appeared on social media by one of the newest sign- signees, Leo Acosta, and so I think that opened a lot of eyes on Friday too. Yeah, he's. Uh, I've seen him in training camp and then in that game, and he's looked really good. He looks ready to uh, compete for a, a regular playing time. Sort of an interesting story about him and, and with a Comets connection. So he played, he's been playing both indoor and outdoor. He was playing for Chicago Mustangs indoor, coached by Comets legend Dino Dolevsky. And Dino had recommended him. I know Zach uh, Reggett knew him. And so he came with a lot of bona fides and proved himself here and earned himself a spot on the roster. He was uh, also with one of his teams. He was teammate with a Milwaukee player that we don't always name. Well, we can name them, sure. Let's do it because it's game week here against the Wave. Derek Hoffman, so uh, two teams actually uh, outdoor in in Chicago. They both play together, so a little bit of familiarity there. And it goes to show that the the Comets are looking all over the place to find players who are going to fit in. Sort of think about this as a 3D jigsaw puzzle to, to put together this opening game roster that will get 
Stefan Stokish where he wants to take this franchise? Yeah, there's we've uh, kind of prided the, the Comets have prided themselves on uh, getting players locally from Park, from UMKC, from elsewhere around here, uh, Sporting Academy, etc. At, but it is good that they're bringing in players from outside the area, and especially with Chicago not having a MASL team, so it's good to poach from there. Well, the other thing I think I can say is um, Zach Reckett has been one of the great ambassadors for this team in terms of trying to encourage people to come to Kansas City, and that's what you want to see is that players, no matter where they're located, they know that the Comets are a strong franchise that this is a franchise committed to winning and that they have players that people want to play with so that's definitely encouraging as you're thinking about this season and the next few seasons on the uh let's see uh, i know we'll get to we'll get to the roster in a minute milwaukee coming up big game the only game against them right uh which is scheduled in masl is always weird but playing one of your biggest rivals once some years it's been way too many times. This year it's too few times. But what have you – Milwaukee's ch roster has changed probably, I don't know if as much, but quite a bit. What have you seen from that? First of all, they still have their core of players. The, the players that we've grown to know over the years, starting with IB26, Ian Bennett up top, uh, newly – Americanized citizen, IB26, by the way, uh, as well as Marcio Leite at the back, also a new American citizen. It's a, it's a similar cast of characters. Derek Huffman playing target. Uh, I know he's been looking forward to this game. He's been getting in, involved in some online banner leading up to this game. But, uh, you know, quality at all lines. I thought that uh, Willie B made an immediate impact coming in last season from Harrisburg. And so, so they're strong. And... They were part of the Florida Tropics fire sale as Kansas City and Milwaukee both uh, reached into that roster. So Ricardo Cavallo, uh, Breno Oliveira, two quality players from Florida made their way north. And so you have a team that finished first in the Eastern Conference last year adding pieces on. So I expect a lot. Here's what's interesting for Comets fans. You'll have an opportunity on Friday on Twitch to watch Milwaukee and St. Louis get a sense of uh, what to expect on Sunday. In, in some ways, I think Milwaukee getting a game over with before coming to Kansas City gives them a little bit of uh, advantage coming into Cable Dom Arena on, on Sunday. Kansas City, that will be their home opener. Other than this Dallas scrimmage that, that we just talked about, they've been practicing, practicing, practicing. So that They'll jump in against Milwaukee as uh, this is our first experience. Milwaukee will have gotten that first one out of the way, and so we'll see the contrast there. And for newer players to indoor, but to the team just in the first game of the season anyway, it's always a ramp up in speed. I mean, you can practice as hard as you want to. You, you know, Stefan and coaches can drive them as hard as they want to, but once it's a real game, it's always 10% more, 20% more. Well, I'd say that plus – getting away from the world famous Kansas City Soccer Dome to Cable Dom Arena where instead of practicing with maybe a couple people here you're going to have 4,000 fans there plus at Cable Dom Arena the biggest rivalry game of the year is the home opener and so people are going to be juiced up for this not just the players but the fans you know the fans have been looking for this one as well because this is going to be the one opportunity uh, to play Milwaukee this year and so if you're a new player you've been hearing about the rivalry they're talking about it in the locker room. And so how on the one hand do you chill a little bit, but also get yourself properly mentally prepared for this game? It's an interesting balance. Yeah, you said 4,000 plus. I've, I've heard it's going to be a good crowd, it, and it's going up against Thanksgiving weekend with people traveling, uh, sporting playing at the same time, and the Chiefs playing you know, right before that, so that overlapping also. Yeah, well, a lot happening in Kansas City, you know. If you want to be a real city, you have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And this whole notion that nothing can compete against each other because everybody in the $2.1 million, uh, 2 .1 million people metropolis can only focus on one thing at a time, I think we've kind of grown past that. No, we have, but it is it does still uh, maybe – harm attendance to a certain extent well I, I think so it, i mean it'll have an impact on on walk up but i i think the people that will be there on sunday th they know what to expect new comets uniforms will be on display and um yeah i think this is this is one i've been looking forward to a long time because in my opinion 
as well as uh, Stefan Stokic recently seconded this when I had a chance to interview him. This is the biggest rivalry for the for the Comets. Milwaukee is. And it is a shame it's only the one game. In the regular season. Right. We'll see what the playoffs bring. We will see. Uh, so, yeah, they brought in new players. Like you said, the, the Florida fire sale. I don't know how many of those have went elsewhere. Have it. Well, Drew Ruggles in San Diego would be. I mean, if you look at the the marquee players that, that left Florida, Drew Ruggles went to San Diego just this past week. Baltimore announced that uh, Victor Pereiras had signed with them. Uh, it's going to be sort of interesting. He has a lot of responsibility in Florida, so he may be traveling a lot between Florida and Baltimore. But um, you look at them, and then a name we haven't mentioned yet today, Chad Vandergriff in Kansas City, one-time MASL Defender of the Year, member of the Elite Six. And so there were so many quality pieces on that team. Comets got goalkeeper depth with Chris Frederick, too. And without looking at the most immediate roster, you can't think about Florida and the Kansas City Comets without talking about Zach Reggett, who bounced between – Florida and Harrisburg to come to Kansas City this past year and uh, you can see here at the soccer excuse me the world famous Kansas City soccer dome that even though he's not the captain of the team he is like a captain on the field and and you watch him play you listen to him in scrimmages and and he is leading there for sure oh, I think anywhere Zach goes he's going to be a uh, uh kind of the leader by heart if he's not the captain. I mean, he's emotional, but he's smart, and he's going to get people fired up one way or the other. And, yeah, it's just so interesting how Florida has had to cease operations for this year. I'm not sure how what all the story is on that right at the moment. But just those players going everywhere and affecting the league, almost like the COVID year. Well, you look at previous uh – indoor leagues you, you you look at trends and this league has actually been fairly stable for recent yes. years which is a, a pleasant surprise but in in previous incarnations where teams have folded or taken time off it's raised the quality of the remaining teams because you go from a certain number of rosters and then you you take one of the best teams in the league and you fold their players across the league, it's only going to make it stronger. And so um, I, I think the quality of a play across the board will once again improve in the MASL this season. Yeah, I, plus just the amount of players that are being brought in of a higher level. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's, there's guys on the roster last year that I think this roster will pass that to a certain extent in talent. Oh, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I mean, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of the same players, but if you look at the pieces, I think that, that there's strength at, at all levels, at all four levels. And uh, it, it's like the same conversation we have all the time. If you can manage your injuries and maybe solve a few visa problems, um, this is a team to watch out for this season. Yeah, and as always, there's at least a few bit uh, visa issues, although not as bad as last year, and they're – mostly expected to resolve themselves faster um actually let's just touch on that for a real quick second i, I know on the official roster right now it shows inactive players junior kazim benji monreal milos Vujic, and akins banton the big guy uh junior i think is expected to be available within the next month or two i i think that's in progress and tbd let's call it that at least what i've heard uh Christian Andereos was, but I, he's not on the inactive roster now, so I hope that means he has gotten his visa. I, let's just say that's not confirmed, but congratulations uh, to Christian. He, he recently got married, yes. and, um, and we'll see. I mean, uh, he's a critical piece because in some ways he's like a junior, no pun intended, version of Stefan Stokic on the field. And getting less hair each year. Uh, no, wait. I shouldn't point that out to Stefan. But uh, I, heard, I, I talked to him last week, and it sounded like it was not going to take very much longer, as in he could be available in the next in the first couple games because it was a, a marriage, not a other status change. Right. It was a little bit simpler. Again, not understanding all the visa rules. But I would expect him, if he's not available for this game, for the, one of the next couple games. Well, and, and with Benji, what the Comets announced when they re-signed him is that he would be eligible to play in Mexico. He's, right. a, he's a, a Mexican citizen. The, the trick is there's three games there, and that's it. 
where does he fit in the rest of the season? TBD. Yeah, and that one I still don't have a full story on, but hopefully we'll have that figured out at some point. But even right now, without Benji, it's still looking like a pretty good roster. Well, you want to talk about the roster? We, we should. We, we can go on positions if you want. And... Well, well, start in the back. Goalie? Well, there's three. Now there's three because uh, Tito was uh, waived a few days ago. Yeah. He actually played in goal at least some for Dallas last week. Yeah, well, I mean, with, with Tito, great guy. He played last season. He started M2 in Dodge City. And uh, the Comets wound up picking him up and uh, because they were having some depth issues. So he's quality where he's going to be picked up somewhere. It's just sort of a question of where. I had the inter- opportunity to interview Stefan Stokic uh, for Comet Social Media, and I asked him the question, what are you looking for in terms of your starting goalkeeper? And he mentioned that, which is dear to my heart, the first thing that's important to him is, is a shot stopper. And w- why I say that is the game has changed so much that some coaches, both indoor and outdoor, are prizing goalkeepers who are strong with their feet. Yes. If you ask uh, Milwaukee Wave uh, fans, they had Josh Lemos for years, and, and he was one of the best goalkeepers with his feet, speaking of visa issues. And so that's not what Stokic said to me. Stokic said shot stopper number one, and he wanted somebody who was going to be vocal. And so for me, those two things check off the box for Nikola Neto. Uh, to be the starter here on Sunday. He's definitely one of the best shot stoppers in the league. He's definitely vocal. I had a chat with him um, this past week, and one of the things I mentioned, and Comets fans and I have this, I don't want to call it love-hate relationship. Let's just call it a relationship when it comes to goalkeeping. I have a different relationship with Milwaukee fans, but that's for different reasons. He... This is my opinion. I think he, well, I know for a fact he agrees with me this year. Because of some of the inconsistency on defense, he was more aggressive than he wanted to be last year. And, and I can't tell you how many times Comets fans would post online, stay in your box, whatever. Yep. But if you feel like your defense is getting beaten on the counter on the transition game and you can either stay on your line and and suffer the consequences or you can get out of your box and take a chance he chose the latter and I think he feels like there's there's more support defensively in front of him that he doesn't have to take those chances this year now we'll see how this plays out but that's what uh his his mindset is in last year but he definitely has competition yeah and we'll we'll speak about the defense and we do think it'll be better this year just for two additions if nothing else but uh it still remains to be seen i mean any team time you change a team you have to see how they actually end up i do think neto sometimes came out a little too quick last year but that's a judgment and it's a lot easier to say when you see the result and not what he saw coming down towards him and i know that from from having played you know myself sometimes you make a choice you have that's the choice you think is best and, and sometimes it fails and sometimes it succeeds uh I do think Neto's a, a really good shot stopper. The, I would say the other keeper that's competing for a starting spot is Philip. How do you say the name? Ejimadu. Ejimadu. Yeah, and it, so let's talk about him. Let's also talk about Chris Frederick too, because here's Frederick is somebody who comes in with MASL experience. Ejimadu, sort of interesting in terms of his journey. He was signed by LAFC academy player right Right. international academy player signed by lafc was loaned to a few usl teams and so he has played at just about every level in the united states now making the transition to indoor and he heard about kansas city once again somebody who's not from the kansas city soccer pipeline and so kudos to the comets for making that connection and bring him in when i've seen him here in practice he checks the boxes too he does. Uh, acrobatic, great shot stopper, um, and uh, vocal, at least what I can hear from, from looking down on, uh, on the world-famous Kansas City Soccer Dome's turf. But uh, l- let's talk a little bit about Chris Frederick, too, because I'm not quite sure who to expect as, as the, the two players on the roster, this, or the, the official game roster this Sunday, because Frederick 
has played with Florida. He has real-time game experience indoor. Ejimado is another one of those outdoor players trying to convert to indoor. I do think it's easier in some ways for goalkeepers to make that transition. But once you're, like you were saying, there's a difference between practice and game. Once you get the game speed and how you read the game is very different indoor than how you read it outdoor. So I think that Coach Stokic is going to have an interesting decision to make for this Sunday and then to see where it goes from there. And uh, every time I seem to come here, the goalkeepers are off the, the main surface and they're sequestered with uh, Coach Alan Mayer and Kenny Mayer working on the second field. Yeah, and I don't want to, when I say that I expect Phillip to be competing for that starting spot and I kind of ignore Fredericks, it's not out of disrespect. The guy's a good keeper and saw him play the other day and he does well. I just see the higher top end, if you want to say, with Phillip. Uh, and I don't know. I would actually probably disagree with you. This could be a discussion for another day. I, I think keeper coming into indoor is probably harder than the other positions because as keeper, once the ball goes past you, it's either in the goal or out. As a defender, you never know what's going to happen. It might be defended, you know, it might be blocked by your, your keeper and is right back in the box. So you're reacting to that. So I, I, I just, and then the weird angles and. No, I think stuff. that's fair, Thad. I think why I mentioned it the way I did is if you're a particularly a midfielder, could be for a forward as well, it's a very different ask on a 120-yard outdoor field right. than it is on a 200-foot indoor field in terms of where you position yourself, how you you create space, how you find space, how you connect with players. It's very much a condensed why do you why do you see teams practicing rondo uh indoor because basically you're going to find yourself in like three seconds with defenders swarming on you and yep. so you have to think fast all the time not so much in the outdoor game you have moments where you have to think fast but but here some of it's mental some of it's tactical and some of it's physical and throw in the uh, sub on the fly, which is sure. quite different, obviously. Sure. Keepers don't usually do that unless they're doing the six attacker. People listening, let us know which position you think is the most difficult transition for an outdoor player coming to indoor who hasn't played it seriously before. Because there's almost everybody in Kansas City as a kid has played indoor soccer. And now they're indoor soccer and futsal, so the transition might be a little bit different for some of them, but it's still a far cry from being professional. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. All right, so that was the three keepers. We're pretty sure Neto's number one. We might differ I think on so. who's number yeah. two or or how that might change over the year because uh, it will be Philip getting experience indoor and, you know, injuries and red cards. And, and, and don't forget that six-game road trip coming up. That That's where you find out what depth you have, yep. particularly at goal, but in some of these other positions. Defense. As they say, defense wins championships. Mm -hmm. And Kansas City has made two big additions, Chad Vandergriff and Robert Palmer. Not last year's Defender of the Year, but the two previous Defender of the Year. Uh, both of them, we've, we've known Robert from being here before. We've known him from playing against him. We've known Chad from playing against him. What do you – I mean, we still have Sosa and a few other people who will be playing defense. Lost Togba. 
that's a f- that's now official. I think we alluded to some of that the last time we recorded, but that's now then official. You went to St. Louis, so that yep. is definitely official. Yes. All right. W- so, way to throw out clues there, Thad. Yeah. Well, we we sometimes hear things that we're not quite sure if we can say yet, so we don't want to give things away. But who else do you see back there? I mean, Debray Holloman. I, I didn't mean to leave him out. Yeah. So let's start with Sunday because uh, lo and behold, Chad Vandergriff has a one game suspension, a carryover of uh, penalty accumulation points from last season. So he will not play on Sunday. And so you start thinking about the lines and, and the matchups. So with Ray Lee, you have a left footed player who you definitely want to run on the left side. What's sort of interesting is last year, uh, not so much on defense, but on special teams, they tried to move him right so that he could cut in. But but during the flow of the game, you would would see him on on the left. What's going to be interesting is who he's going to be paired up all season with because both – Birdo and and Chad are are naturally right-footed players, although I think they both can can play on either side. And here's why I mention it, because you'll have Sosa out there too. Sosa, you definitely want him on the right because you're wanting him to counter and and start the attack. And so I'm making the assumption that you won't see Lee Sosa as a normal pairing. I think they'll break them up. It's just sort of a question of, Where's the right chemistry and what's the right fit? You mentioned Debray Holloman. I think you definitely, uh, not only just this Sunday, but in general, see where he fits in. A lot of MASL experience, too, so I don't want to sell him short. And there's some other pieces out there, too. Uh, There are players who have played in the back when called upon. We haven't talked about number 14 in terms of what his role is going to be this year. We've seen Nacho pulled back when he when he's had to, but but I think those five probably where you start. But I know that there's a you know potential signing or two coming up in, in terms of players who aren't on the roster yet who might get into the mix there. Yeah, well, uh, I think both of them I saw as midfielders, but I'm not totally sure. Well, one for sure. The other could play in a couple different positions, but we'll see. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and mention one name. Because I'm pretty sure it's going to be announced today, tomorrow, so shortly. Uh, Eric, what's his last Probably name? That, uh, so, so he played last year for St. Louis Ambush. He has experience before that indoor played with Springfield Demise with none other than Rian Marquez. Notice how I just slightly paused. It's like, okay, we agreed on Marquez. So. Yeah. Which, uh, I, which I am advocating for just calling him Rion. Well, we could do that. Once they put it on the jersey, then it's for real. And so he brings indoor experience at, at multiple levels. So a, another piece of this right here. And uh, another interesting signing forthcoming that maybe we can talk about at the next episode. Um, significant Kansas City outdoor experience. Yes. Uh, I will say Academy... Swill Park Rangers, SKC2. Um, and I think he will make an impact when he gets – again, he's looked good in practice. I've seen him score some goals, set up some goals. Uh, it'll be interesting. I, I just don't want to say his name quite yet because I, I want to make sure that the the all the legal ramifications are, are covered. So Well, and the, and the other thing, if you think about when, when the Comets have gone this route in recent years, they haven't been able to hold that player – in some cases, it's because they somebody turned on their engine. It's a little nice background noise yeah. here. Um, they've either been sharing them or getting them on loan. I'm, I'm thinking of Matt Lewis, Kyle McLaughlin, Mc, McLaughlin, uh, Chase, Chase Bromfield. Yeah, Rab Chase. So there have been multiple players who made an immediate impact, but the comments couldn't hold them for one reason or another. And so if they can seal the deal and get an announcement of somebody who's who's come up through similar ranks but who's going to stay, I think that would be huge for this franchise. And my understanding is the plan is for him to stay and be here all year. That could obviously change. Sure. He's a, he's a guy I think that uh, some outdoor teams would still like to maybe take a look at. But I, I think he – I do think the plan is for him to be here all year. So. Right. And, and you, you, I guess a good opportunity to pit, pivot to the midfield because they're – a huge cast of characters in this midfield right now, and so it's sort of be interesting to see where the line's set up. All right, so who should we – let's see. Running down the list of people listed as a midfielder, 
I think the new signing of Leo Acosta. Yep. He's listed as a midfielder because uh, he was just officially announced. He was. Uh, Lucas Sosa. Ramon's listed. I mean, for me, Ramon Palmer is a midfielder, but I guess part of it depends on on where Coach Stokic lines him up. But I think of him as a midfielder. Sometimes he's called a forward. Yeah, yeah. It's Ramon can float. That's the nice yeah. thing. I mean, he he can even drop back and give you a shift on defense. Right. Although not his best spot. Right. Uh, let's see. We went through Lucas, uh, Francisco Lopez, Cisco. Cisco. Which, for me, I see him more as a second forward. But, again, we'll see. The uh, Henry Ramirez. And good to see Henry back from injury. Yep. But he's definitely a spark plug in the midfield. He, uh, he got some good time in the Dallas game. Looked pretty good. Again, it's always hard to judge because you're playing against a team that's traveled up. It's not an official game. I don't know I don't know their roster well enough to know if they were – plus it didn't have numbers on anyway that I saw. So I don't know who they were, if that's their best team, their worst team, or what they were doing there. I, I think he had a n lot of new faces, and Coach Piscarich did. Yes. Uh, Adrian Gutierrez. Guti. But Guti. Guti. Uh, so Guti is sort of an interesting guy because this if, – if you – Subscribe to the logic that it usually takes three seasons for uh, a midfielder to adapt to the indoor game. Okay, game on. You have somebody who was a national player of the year, uh, NAIA at, at Central Methodist University. So this is somebody who has a significant soccer pedigree. He's shown flashes, but hasn't been on a consistent shift yet. And so, I mean, for me, the midfield is where all the action's going to be in terms of jockeying for playing time. Yeah, that's going to be the most complex for sure. And uh, I, I think it's been a struggle with uh, his other job that's always prevented him from having as much time as he wanted to play. And I think they've kind of got the shifts worked out that he can train more often and, and play much more frequently. When I've seen him out here, he's looked pretty good. It's just that he, you have to play frequently in order to be in that rhythm. Absolutely. So it, it'll be, again, a lot, so much of this is interesting to see how it works out. I mean, we, it's before the season. Uh, Lalo. And Lalo has g gotten minutes the last couple of years. This could be a year for him, too. As a, as he's another guy that got significant time against Dallas and looked pretty good. Again, not knowing the competition level, but uh, moving on to Nacho. Well, Nacho, you, you talk about somebody who's part of that core, and he's vocal out there, and I, I think he's a Stokic guy, and so definitely expect to see a lot of Nacho this season. After, honestly, I can't remember if it was the Dallas scrimmage or the inter-squad scrimmage the other day, but Nacho was set up about 10 feet, 15 feet outside the box. Rian just stepped up to the corner. Nacho basically bounced it off Rian's head into the goal. Beautiful pass, perfect pass. I said I said something to Rian about a good goal, and he's like, "That was Nacho. That had nothing to do with it." Right. Uh, but it was. He's looked really good, and he's a guy who, I think, has been challenged with some injuries over the last few years. He would kind of get into a good rhythm and be playing really well, and then uh, some other injury would pop up, and he would be struggling for. He he wasn't his best self when he was out there for a lot of the last couple three seasons no well, the other thing he brings grit which i think you you want to see too he'll um as uh, brian bazinski will tell you he gets stuck in on tackles and and you want players like that on your team absolutely it's, uh, we mentioned uh christian and i'm not sorry i'm saying that yeah right. and so he in brings all sorts of dimensions in terms of not just on a regular shift but Definitely on the penalty kill, he's he's one of the people you want out there. He also can play defensive runner, which may come in handy depending on how number 14 is used this year. Yeah, and Christian, I think, uh, what, two years ago, he was the, the regular defensive runner. Last year, I think he got more shifts elsewhere, but he would still be the defensive runner once in a while, more, more true midfield, more true forward, whichever one he was doing at the time. He's a guy I, I just love, great attitude. Great work ethic. Got to love that guy. Let's see. Any other midfielders? Who am I missing? Well, there, there's um, there's a few players here. I'm still kind of trying to figure out where they're gonna where they're gonna play in. Uh, we haven't talked a lot on this podcast about Jacob Garza. He got minutes at the end of the season. 
he can play on different lines too. I saw that when he played a season at Park University. And so th there's multiple players where it's not quite clear what the vision is, but but it, it's like in other sports when you have utility players that you can plug in in different roles. It's going to be kind of interesting to see where, where Coach Stokich envisions some of these guys. Yeah, Jacob's a guy who last preseason I was impressed with. And then he didn't get signed right away. Then when he finally got signed, I was like, you know, yes, good. And the thing that impressed me with, with him in preseason, again, everything is how you transition to the, the, the professional game. But in preseason, when they were doing smaller sided games and things like that, he was always a guy who would win the ball. I mean, he, he wasn't always the guy who made the perfect pass, but he would win that ball. So I, I, I see him as a great defensive runner person right now. And then he can help, trans, you know, maybe transition to be more. Uh, but, yeah, he can fill in in several spots and give you some quality minutes. Uh, he's listed technically as a forward. so Right, and so uh, that, that's what's interesting. Maybe that's a good transition to forward because uh, some teams, if you think about forwards and midfielders, they're very specific that the forward is the target and everybody else who's not the target is a midfielder. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, for me, and this is really old school indoor, you have two forwards, one midfielder, two defenders. And so the off forward um, is the one who's working in space and, and not your target. And why I think that's significant is when we talk about the forwards, there's definitely a few that you would see they may play with their, their back to the defender and be looking to get balls in the corner as opposed to making runs off of. And so maybe we, we run through the, the the forwards and then, then talk a little bit where they might fit in this season. Let's see. Uh, so going from Jacob back up the roster, we have Rian. Has had a lot of injuries. I mean, he started off huge as his rookie season, and I think that he would tell you that last year was was disappointing and and um I'm hopeful he's going to bounce back in terms of production this season but but view him as your prototypical target forward big guy right you go back uh in comments history to somebody like jan goosens where you play the dump and chase game where you dump the ball into the into the corner and then they get the ball off the glass and then they're looking to, to make a move and i think that what i would call the two pure targets on the on the comments roster Definitely fit in that mode. Let's see. On going back up the chain, we have Leo. Well, there's your other one. So Leo plays that game. He's not nearly as tall as no. Rion, but experienced. And what's interesting, I'll have a factoid on uh, Sunday's broadcast that the first time he steps on the field uh, at Cable Dahmer, uh, he will be the fifth player in Kansas City indoor soccer history over you know 40 or over to be playing professional indoor. So that's quite a milestone for the legend and in the broadcast you will tell who the others are i will absolutely not tell not today but i will absolutely do that uh, still going up the the list here zach reggett so zach ha has been fitted in as a target but i definitely see him as more of a, a wide player and i would expect y you would see him with more movement this year he was getting creamed at the target last year because people didn't want to give him any space I think if he can get the ball in space, make that first cut, make that first step, that's where he's a little bit more dangerous. Yeah, totally agree there. Uh, we already mentioned Ramon, who can kind of play he's, he, multiple I mean, lines. He, he's either midfielder or off forward, depending on where he fits in. Yeah. Let's see, I think that's – well, going to the back to the players who are listed as inactive, uh, junior – Definitely, uh, he's in the box, outside the box, terrific. Uh, what's going to be interesting is once he's eligible, where he fits in, because I would expect that they'll run, um, for most games, a two-shift offense with with uh, Leo and Rion rotating as, as the target. So it'll be interesting to see where Junior fits in in all this whether he supplants one of them, whether they put him out wide a little bit, or whether they go to a three-shift at target. I mean, there's a lot of different ways Coach Stokic can play this. The uh, Part of that strategy, though, will be having that target player, like kind of like you were talking about, having the target player and then another guy running off of them, which is kind of 
Zach's bread and butter, we, we believe, right? We have, I think that's right. We haven't got right. to see it as much here as we wanted to, but if you have him and Leo out there, him and Rian, him and Junior, Zach is a smart player. He can do all the, the things that he needs to do. It'll be very interesting to see if they can make work that combo, but then you're, somebody's got to be the de facto midfielder, so that would probably end up being Zach. Well, well, the other thing's going to be interesting because I've had multiple conversations with Coach, Coach Stokic now about the transition game and how he values the transition game. And you start thinking about the pieces that we've mentioned. Start with that defensive line, and I'm thinking of John Sosa. He's thinking offense, and he's thinking about, okay, how do I find the guys up front, get my assist in? You think about somebody in the midfield, Lucas Sosa, who's – uh, he can play both ways, but definitely one of the best goal-scoring midfielders in the league. And then you look at the options up front. And so I think what's going to be interesting, in addition to how Coach Stokic pieces this all together, is the discipline, meaning that it can't be about scoring 11 goals a game. There are some teams in this league that that's their mentality. But if you want to win a championship in this league – you have to bring it both ways. I, I know we've talked about this already to a certain extent in the previous podcast, but how many goals last year was given up on a counter, on a fast break? Oh, too many, too many. And you look at uh, me, I love watching high-scoring games, and I get that. It's sort of like the, the issue between your heart and your brain, right? right. My, my heart's telling me, let's take on any team and uh, try to outscore them, but my brain's telling me, okay, if you look at the franchises that have been consistently good record-wise, playoff-wise in recent years, and it, it, San Diego soccers are the first team that comes to mind, they have two of the best defensive pairings in indoor soccer, and you know that they're going to shut you down, and so if you can score four or five against them, that that's a pretty good day, right? right? Uh, there are teams like Utica that would love to, to score 11 goals and take their chances with you. But Comets are going to have to find a personality, new coach, newish coach, I guess we can say, new pieces in the puzzle. How can you score the way they want to score? They know they want to score, but yet be disciplined enough where it's – not going to force Neto to, to play the way he did last year because everybody's pushing up. It's kind of like when you play in a house league indoors here at the soccer dome, Thad. Nobody wants to play defense. Everybody's right. pushing up. If you're the one defender back or the goalie back, you know you have a bunch of forwards and midfielders that are just turning around and watching the play when they get countered. That's not a way to win a championship in the major arena soccer league. No, but it is a lot of fun in the house league. Oh, it's absolutely fun in the house league. Yeah, I don't know how many house teams I volunteered to play on as a defender because I was mostly a defender, and I love that three-on-ones coming at me because if, if, if they score a goal, it's not my fault. It's the midfielder's fault. If, if I shut it down, I'm damn good. So yeah, I love yeah that. The, the main, there's, there's probably three or four main differences uh, in that, Thad. One is – uh, you're not getting paid to play here in the nope. house league. Nope. Second is you don't have a lot of fans watching you yelling at what happened to you. And then, then there's the whole issue of uh, online chatter, uh, chat and banner in terms of the world is ending because we gave up how many goals this way. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic for the Comets this year, but I think it's going to take a little bit of time for Coach Stokic's system and philosophy to completely materialize on the field. How much do you think his, because his career was as a defender and as a defensive runner, uh, I mean, you know, indoor players play almost every position at some point, you know, even goalie is a six attacker, mm -hmm. but he was a really good defender and a really good defensive runner. How much do you think that informs his coaching style in this game, or does it? No, I think it does too. And, and so I, I sort of challenge the notion that you need somebody who is a superstar player to be your head coach. I mean, ultimately, the way you're going to win a championship is if you have a full team effort every game, and particularly as you're heading into the playoffs. So having somebody who, who not only played defense, but um, as a defensive runner, I have vivid memories of him throwing his body on the field. Um, 
And, and it's going to take that mentality where everybody is sacrificing for the greater good. They're sacrificing for the team. In some ways, I think that that has a, a better opportunity of rubbing off on, on the players rather than, okay, everybody on an island, be individually good, and, and we'll take our chances there. I think that the, the Comets, at least on paper, haven't lacked for talent. What they've lacked is the ability as a team to play effectively in every sense of the game. And I think his background affords them a chance to maybe view this all different. And uh, to quote the legendary Disney Channel movie, High School Musical, we're all in this together. And so if they believe that we're all in this together, I think the results will play out on the field. And it depends on how you look at things, but you know, there's different phases of the game. Defense, offense, transition defense to offense, transition offense to defense, uh, you know, special teams, et cetera. So you know, it depends on how you want to classify all those, but the transition game was what was lacking coming back to defense. And not that people weren't necessarily trying to get back. It just wasn't as organized and as maybe hard as it could have been. Transition forward. Uh, they often tried to slow it down and possess and then, like, nibble away. And, you know, I, again, I don't want to say, you know, the thousand fans sitting behind me while I'm shooting photos is right, but sometimes they needed to be faster and shoot faster. No, and, and, and I think that's right, too. I also think the power play was a, a little bit anemic last year in terms of the ball moving, and so a lot that they've had to work on in the off season in terms of to get ready. And uh, as we said earlier, the, the overall – quality of the league has improved and so just about every team has loaded up and and I'm including Harrisburg in there Tacoma's brought in players I mean every game is going to be a battle and so this notion maybe a few years ago that you could look at at the schedule and you could bank on the guaranteed wins there I, I don't think that's the case anymore I mean I, I think that that every team on any given day will give the Comets problems. And so there's no looking past anybody anymore, like there might have been, I don't know, three, four seasons ago. Yeah, uh, parity for fans of a good team, you know, they might hate that, but parity is good for the league and parity of, of being, not necessarily like every team can win the championship, but every team can win and play well and all that stuff is good for games. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I think since they were here, let's let's talk about the Dallas Sidekicks just for a second. There were some games a few years ago that were painful to watch because Dallas was trying to find its identity. Um, they were dealing with some turnover, and so for the Comets to beat them by eight goals, they could do this on an off day. And so you have a team that's now trying to reinvent itself in a very talent-rich market, and so maybe not this season, but I, I, I talked with Coach Biscarich about this, is he has a network, he's gonna bring in players, and so I think the expectation now is more than just we'll put a team on the field, sell some tickets, and, and declare victory. It's what is it gonna take to get better, and what is it gonna take to bring a championship back to our, our fans in our city? Maybe a, a month into this season, we should sit down and kind of look. It just it, it drove a thought because, you know, you, you want to, you were mentioning, you know, just put a team on the field and sell some tickets. Well, it's for t teams to be successful and last, they have to put a team on the field that fans want to watch. They also have to sell the tickets that fans want to come buy those tickets. And you have to have, you know, reasonable markets and, you know, reasonable places to play. All of those factor into being a, a team that will – and contributing to this league growing because I mean we're not we wouldn't be here talking about indoor soccer if we didn't love indoor soccer it's not the largest sport in the United States it's not the largest form of soccer by any means like it like it was in the 80s but it is a fun sport and it's something that could grow and get maybe not back to where it was but definitely could grow and be a a, a a player well and and going back to what you said about parody for me the parody makes the rivalries more intense because yes. you don't know what's going to happen and yes i believe kansas city's rivalry with milwaukee is the best but that st louis rivalry i think will increase and intensify this year based on what's we've witnessed outdoor between sporting kansas city and st louis city not just on the field, but off the field. I think that there are going to be fans coming to Cable Dahmer Arena here in a couple weeks that absolutely want to see a St. Louis team destroyed. And 
Yeah, you know, there have been some good games between the Comets and the Ambush in recent years, but I think the, let's just call it the venom that maybe we've seen in the past, um, we'll see if that intensifies. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that outdoor rivalry, the one where St. Louis managed to, to get some wins in the regular season but were absolutely destroyed in the uh, postseason. I remember that. that mattered. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Not that, you know, St. Louis fans should hate me because I'm actually originally from St. Louis. So it should be fun. But you, but you need that in the league. You need the parity. You need the, the rivalries. You need that to not be too intense, but you need it to be there. Well, and, and there are rivalries. When I when I interviewed uh, Brian Budzinski, for him, the biggest one is San Diego. And, and I think that uh, my good friend, the professor, who still calls the San Diego soccer is the evil empire when San Diego rolls into town for the uh, the finale at, at Cable Dom Arena. For me, I get palpable feelings inside anytime I see San Diego in person get on the field. I mean, I, I feel it. I, I know for some people, they feel it with Milwaukee, they feel it with St. Louis. For me, and this goes back decades, when I see the soccers come onto the field, my heart rate elevates, it becomes more intense, it becomes more real. If you can get that across the league and, and across games, that keeps people in the fans, that makes the games more inciting, and that makes every game mean more. Yep. And, and that's what this league needs. Again, something we probably uh, analyze a little more in depth on a pod where we have less to talk about, but I always think that who you see as a rivalry is either from those intense games or who you want to be. So you, you might have a rivalry. Bud might have a rivalry with San Diego because of how good they were. Yeah, right. It's not because of the amount of games between the two teams. It's because you wanted to knock them off. Yeah, no, and I, and I think that's right. And I think there, there's always a sense that if you're not the team who's won 16 championships, that um, we've been following our team, we've been supporting the team for how many years. They win everything. It's our turn. We're due. And so, I mean, I, I think it's great that there are going to be more opportunities for Comets fans this season to get beyond Milwaukee, to look at San Diego, look at some other teams. And, um, and uh, I... I think this is going to be even better season than last year was, on and off the field. All right. Anything we forgot to discuss today, Eric? Well, if you uh, can join us on Sunday at Cable Dom Marina, kickoff at 5.05 p.m. If you can't join us, Nick Masslis and I will be back on air. We're excited about this. We'll be locally on 38th The Spot in Kansas City. We'll be on Twitch as well, and uh, looking forward to a great call. I will be there, although I will be a little antsy with trying to watch the sporting game stats going on at the same time, but I will be there. It's called multitasking, Thad. It's hard to multitask when you're shooting a game, though. You'll have to figure it out, won't you? Uh, there will be a few pulling the phone out, oh, yeah, but uh, I will be there. Uh, so, yeah, everybody come on out. It should be a very entertaining game, if nothing else, and see some of the new players for the comments, which I think we'll see at least uh, some new ones on the field for sure. And... Any last words? Well, and to all the Milwaukee Wave fans who might be listening in, um, I'll see you online on Sunday. Yeah, and you can you can come down and watch, and you can also hate listen to this pod. Appreciate it. Thank you. They all count. We're out.